دكتور خالد بليز بروسيد الو الو دي بروفيسور عند دي بروفيسور عند كوليك اي هاف ذا بليجر تو شير ذيس فاريبل ويبينار ويز ان ايمنت جروب اوف بروفيسورز ذات ويل توك اباوت ذا هوت توبكس ان هارت فيلير and in spite that the last guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology published in 2016, but I am sure that our eminent speakers have the new to discuss uh, with us. Uh, today, sharing, sharing me uh, in the moderation of this uh, webinar, my dear friend, Professor Magdi Abdelhamid, the Professor of Cardiology, Cairo University, and the immediate past president of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology, and the president of the Egyptian Working Group of Heart Failure and the board member of the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology. And we have today four elegant speakers. The first will be Dr. Magda Abdelhamid, and the second will be Professor John Moray, the professor of medical cardiology and the director of the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Science of the University of Glasgow, and also the honorary consultant cardiologist of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, the third speaker will be Professor Scott Solomon, Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School, and the Director of Non-Invasive Cardiology and Senior Physician at Bergam and Women's Hospital, USA. The last uh, speaker uh, will be Professor Bitar uh, Sivorovic, the president of the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology and the professor of cardiology at University of Belgrade and the president of Heart Failure Society uh, of uh, Serbia. Uh, now, uh, the first speaker uh, uh, will be Dr. Magda Abdelhamid. He will talk about the diagnostic approach and management of heart failure with preservative ejection uh, fraction. Dr. Baggi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you for the International Heart Failure Webinar organized by the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. And the title of this webinar is Hot Topics in Heart Failure. First of all, I'd like to uh, like to welcome my coordinator, uh, Professor Khalid Chokri. Uh, professor Khalid Chokri is a professor of cardiology in Military Medical Academy and uh, Dean of Armed Forces College of Medicine and the president of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. Professor Khalid is supporting all activities of the society and is doing a great job uh, during this critical time of the pandemic. Allow me to uh, welcome our uh, guest faculty today. We have uh, three distinguished international speakers who are experts and the pioneer in the field of heart failure worldwide. We can take uh, more than one day if we would like to uh, 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 speak about the CV of each speaker, uh, Professor uh, John McMurray, Professor Scott Solomon, Professor Peter Sibrovich. Uh, so I'd like uh, to uh, welcome them and uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. And uh, uh, this uh, webinar uh, will be uh, a fruitful discussion. We have a lot of attendees from Egypt and from the region. So I encourage all of the attendees to actively participate in this webinar by uh, sending your question, which will be answered by our uh, guest faculty at the end of uh, this webinar. So uh, I'd like uh, to start my presentation. And uh, my assignment today is the diagnostic approach and the management of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This is my disclosure. Uh, we know that uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is uh, uh, a heterogeneous disease at the level of uh, etiology, phenotypes, uh, comorbidities, uh, therapeutically as well. And it is considered as the most common form of heart failure associated with the substantial morbidity and mortality. HFPF is defined hemodynamically as a clinical syndrome associated with lack of capacity of the heart to pump blood adequately. 
without the elevation of uh, feeding pressure. Unfortunately, clinical trials today have been largely unsuccessful in identifying effective treatments for patients with uh, HFPEF. HFPEF uh, can be diagnosed according to the 2016 ECC guidelines. Patients who have symptoms and signs of heart failure with an ejection fraction of 50% or more, elevated levels of natriuretic peptides, and at least one additional criteria, relevant structural heart disease, such as left ventricular hypertrophy and or left atrial enlargement, and the evidence of uh, diastolic uh, dysfunction. This slide uh, shows the uh, syndrome of uh, half uh, patients, and we can see that we have other diseases which can produce the same clinical situation of patients with HFPEF. And fortunately, the patients who have cardiac amyloidosis, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiac sarcoidosis, constricted pericarditis, valvular heart disease, uh, coronary artery disease, high output heart failure, myocarditis, or uh, toxins, can be diagnosed by uh, imaging tools, either non-invasive or invasive studies, including hemodynamic measurements. And we have different treatment options uh, for such patients. So the etiology of patients who have uh, symptoms and signs suggestive of half patients, we have to exclude other etiologies which are mentioned now. This interesting is slide from uh, a review article uh, published in the circulation one year ago by Professor Mark Piffer and his colleagues uh, for the pathophysiologic progression of HFPEF. And we can see that uh, the presence of risk factors like aging, obesity, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, coronary artery disease, all this uh, will lead to tissue and cell pathology in the form of systemic inflammation, myocardial ischemia, tissue fibrosis, abnormal energetics, and altered cell signaling, myocyte hypertrophy, increased collagen deposition, and increased interstitial myocardial fibrosis, which will lead to left ventricular structural remodeling, concentric hypertrophy, eccentric LVH, and this will lead to decreased LV functional reserve. So inotropy will decrease the chronotropic incompetence and the impaired relaxation. This will lead to an abnormal hemodynamics in the form of high left ventricular filling pressures, decreased organ perfusion. So we are expecting to see different clinical presentations in the form of lung congestion, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary vascular remodeling, right ventricular dysfunction, and this is a clinical syndrome of uh, HFPEF patients. And the HFA uh, consensus recommendations uh, uh, one year ago, this is the slide showed the risk factors and the findings consistent with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So patients who are elderly, about 70 million women, overweight or obesity, metabolic syndrome and diabetes, uh, physical inactivity, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, ECG abnormalities like atrial fibrillation, high, L, high levels of natriuretic peptides, either PNP more than 35 picogram per milli or nt pro more than 125 picogram per milli. So the presence of these criteria are suggestive for diagnosis of half patients who have symptoms and signs of heart failure. So the diagnostic approach for HFPEF in patients who have unexplained shortness of breath, assessment of pretest probability is important by clinical evaluation and echocardiography. And nowadays we have two important scoring systems for diagnosis. Either uh, HFPEF score, uh, which has many variables like obesity, if you are obese, you will get two points, hypertension, one point, atrial fibrillation, three points, P for pulmonary hypertension, one point, if the pulmonary artery pressure above 35 millimeter mercury, age above 60, you'll get one point, and uh, P over E prime more than nine, another one point. So the score is from six to nine. 
Another important scoring system, which was suggested by the HFA, according to functional and morphological changes, either major criteria or minor criteria. So the major criteria include the septal E prime less than seven centimeter per second, lateral E prime less than 10 centimeter per second, E over E uh, prime ratio more than 15, uh, tricuspid regurgitation more than 2.8 meter per second, pulmonary artery pressure more than 35. Minor criteria if the E over E prime more uh, in, from 9 to 14 or uh, global longitudinal strain less than 16. And uh, this slide uh, shows the clinical, laboratory, and imaging predictors of HAFA. Uh, this uh, was published uh, uh, one month ago in the Nature Review Cardiology. And we can see the predictors for diagnosis uh, with a high odds ratio uh, was detected in elderly above 60 years for hypertension, atrial fibrillation, very high levels of NT probing B or patients who were implanted pacemaker. Also cardiomegaly or uh, increased left atrial volume index about 30 milli per square meter, E over E prime more than 13, high pulmonary artery systolic pressure. These are uh, predictors for patients who have a diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So how to treat patients with HEPA? We have an established guidelines for patients with uh, HEPREV. Current management of uh, heart failure with preserved Estimated GFR more than 30 milli per minute, a creatinine less than 2.5 milligram per deciliter, a serum potassium less than 5 milli equivalent per liter. And this slide they summarize the different clinical trials for pharmacological treatment of patients with HFPAP. And we can see that the use of uh, S inhibitor like uh, perindopril and PIP heart failure trial can be certain in the SHARM preserved arm. RP sartan in eye preserved study. All this study, the primary endpoint in terms of all cause death or heart failure hospitalization was neutral, except uh, decreased hospitalization with the use of candy sartan in patients uh, with the charm preserved arm. The use of angiotensin receptor blocker and neprilizin inhibitor, which is ARNI or sacrobitary balsartan. In Paramount study was associated with significant reduction in the levels of nt in B, as well as decrease in the left atrial volume. Paragon trial, which is considered as neutral study, however, sub-analysis proved an important results, which will be discussed now. And uh, the use of beta blockers, which should be used cautiously in patients with HFPEF due to the chronotropic incontinence, which is common in those patients. And TOPCAT trial using spironolactone, which is considered also a neutral trial with the geographical variations. And aldosterone receptor antagonist spironolactone in patients with EF more than 50% was associated in a study included for 100 patients and improvement a reduction in the E over E prime, decreased levels of NT rho in B, decreased LV mass, but no effect on quality of life. Again, charm preserved, the PEP heart failure trial, I preserved, no statistically significant p value comparing uh, placebo versus uh, the active arm, candy sartan, perindopril, or RP sartan. In the top CAC trial, although the p value was not significant, however, sub analysis comparing the results in North America and South America versus uh, results in uh, uh, Russia and Georgia a significant uh, reduction in the uh, primary endpoint, mainly decreased hospitalization, uh, was detected in uh, the American population. And this was explained by uh, geographical variations that uh, 
patients included in uh, other areas uh, were not uh, have the full criteria of HEPA patients or were not given uh, the treatment. And the cannabinoid level, which is a metabolite of spironolactone, was lower in patients uh, subjected to the arm in Russia and Georgia. Started. So uh, the use of spironolactone was associated with the reduction in hospital admission. Now, what was an important study, which is Secretary Valsartan. I think the hypothesis that Secretary Valsartan compared with Valsartan would reduce the composite outcome of total heart failure, hospitalization, and cardiovascular death. So, uh, active single blind run imperial starting by. And in Acobitri, Balsar 10 to 100 milligram PID or Balsar 10 to 160 milligram PID, looking for the primary endpoint, which was composite of total heart failure, hospitalization, and cardiovascular death. Secondary endpoints uh, improved near function class, uh, changes in the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, time to first occurrence of worsening renal failure, and all cause mortality. The inclusion criteria, patients uh, about 50, uh, ejection fraction more than 45, uh, elevation and natriuretic lipase, and the exclusion criteria, EF less than 40%, blood pressure less than 110. If we look for uh, the results, the primary outcome uh, in terms of total heart failure, hospitalization, and cardiovascular death was not a statistically significant uh, uh, reduce. However, a non-significant 13% reduction uh, was observed with the use of sacrobitrin valsartan compared with uh, uh, valsartan alone. And we can see that uh, this was driven mainly by a reduction in heart failure hospitalization. There was no significant reduction in cardiovascular death. If we look for the secondary endpoints, we can see that uh, the use of uh, secretary valsartan was associated with a significant improvement in the near function class and the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire indicating a better quality of life. More than five points improvement was statistically significant and the worsening renal function was uh, significantly higher with valsartan compared with secretary valsartan. So the safety of drug was proved also in this uh, uh, trial, and the all-cause mortality was not statistically significant uh, between both. Uh, interestingly, sub-analysis uh, of this uh, important uh, trial, looking for the outcome in men and women, we can see that uh, primary endpoint uh, uh, decreased significantly in women more than men, and also in patients with lower ejection fraction from 45 to 57% compared with patients who have an ejection fraction more than 57%. And this was statistically significant. So this is an important data for the sub-analysis of paragon heart failure trial. Another sub-analysis uh, proved also a significant reduction in nt probing b level by 19% and also uh, the beneficial effect of the drug when given in proximity to heart failure hospitalization, we know the critical time for patients with heart failure hospitalized, hospitalized recently. So the data proved that patients, patients who were given the drug in less than 30 days after hospitalization, the outcome of primary endpoint was better compared with patients who were given the drug more than 180 days or patients who were not hospitalized. This is an interesting uh, data from uh, Paragon trial, uh, which was published in Jack uh, recently uh, by uh, Cunningham and his colleagues. Uh, and the rationale for uh, uh, this study that uh, circulating biomarkers that reflect uh, extracellular matrix uh, homeostasis are abnormal in patients with heart failure. In addition, the baseline values of these biomarkers are predictors of heart failure events, irrespective of the clinical variables or natriuretic size. So the rationale 
that sacro valsartan compared with valsartan alone favorably changes the levels of uh, these biomarkers. So a uh, different biomarkers for extra serum matrix uh, uh, in the form of uh, uh, some markers which increase the or uh, uh, PINP or uh, B3NP, uh, fortunately, the drug secondary valsartan was associated with significant reduction in ST2 protein, as well as significant reduction in uh, 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 level of TEMP1. TEMP1 normally is responsible for inhibiting matrix metalloproteinases degradation. So the biomarkers which reflect collagen synthesis are decreased. So a significant reduction in these biomarkers, as we can see here, either after 16 weeks of the study or comparison between the baseline levels of biomarkers and after uh, 48 weeks, we can see the significant reduction in ST2 Uh, remodeling in uh, half -f patients, uh, uh, which increase hemodynamic and metabolic load, fibroplast uh, convert to activated fibroplast. This will increase collagen senses and decrease collagen degradation. And the sacrobitri valsartan in Paragon trial was associated with significant reduction. I think uh, the uh, with HFF, this would be discussed in details by uh, Professor Jean-Marc Jean Moray for uh, uh, Imperor uh, Preserved uh, or uh, other studies for uh, dimagliflozin uh, in patients with HFF. So the take home message, uh, ladies and gentlemen, diagnosis and treatment of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction are challenging for clinicians. To date, most clinical trials on the efficacy of treatment for HFF have produced neutral results, but strong evidence support the use of diuretics, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, and the exercise training as an effective therapy. Paragon trial uh, secondary valsartan in HFF patients was associated with reduction hospitalization for heart failure and significant improvement in clinical condition. Interestingly, some analysis prove that uh, the drug was associated with significant benefit uh, in two pre-specified subgroups, patients in the lower EF, 45 to 57, and in women. And finally, sacrobitri valsartan has a favorable effect as an anti-fibrotic drug, as evidenced by significant reduction in biomarkers of interstitial myocardial fibrosis. Thank you for your attention. I'd like uh, to uh, invite you for Cardio Egypt uh, 2021, which will be held in Cairo from 15 to 18 February. Thank you very much. Professor Khalid. He's on mute. Uh, thanks, Dr. Magdi, for your uh, elegant lecture. And uh, I'm sure that uh, there is uh, many audience have uh, a lot of questions, uh, uh, but we leave, uh, as we agreed, uh, we will leave uh, uh, the discussion at the end of the session. I, I, I will leave you to uh, introduce uh, uh, the second speaker, uh, uh, Dr. John uh, Moray. Please, Dr. Magdi, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Moray. Uh, 
Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, uh, Jean McMurray. He is a professor of medical cardiology, deputy director of uh, Institute of Cardiovascular Medical Science at the University of uh, Glasgow, UK, honorary consultant cardiologist at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, Glasgow. Professor McMurray has been leading many clinical trials in heart failure, in heart failure for decades. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajon, for accepting the invitation. And we are honored that uh, we're having you for the second time in a virtual meeting in Egypt. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, but you'll have to let me share my screen. So somebody needs to release the screen share so that I can share mine. Yeah, this one, stop share. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, just let me share my screen and put my slides on and get them to full screen. Put my pointer on. Nearly ready. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, I'm delighted to be talking again. And uh, I'm also delighted to be talking about diabetes and heart failure, which is a subject that I have been passionate about for a long time. So these are my disclosures. I'm not going to read through these, but uh, my university gets paid for my participation in clinical trials. So I want to talk about two things tonight. I want to talk about the prevention of incident new onset heart failure and then I want to treat, uh, talk about the treatment of prevalent heart failure in relation, of course, to diabetes. So I think the most important thing to say at the start is that the world of diabetes changed completely and utterly in 2008. And for us as cardiologists, it's probably extraordinary to find out that the treatments used for patients with type 2 diabetes, most of them had never been tested in a large cardiovascular outcome trial or indeed a large outcome trial of any type. And you can see here the timeline for clinical trials before 2008 using glucose lowering therapies. The very first of these with a sulfonuria very controversial actually showed apparently an increase in cardiovascular risk then the UK PDS and really until very recently nothing happened but in 2008 everything changed it changed because of a drug called rosiglitazone and a family of drugs called TZDs TZDs glitazones and because safety concerns were raised in relation to these drugs. And because of the controversy surrounding the safety concerns, the US Food and Drug Administration made it mandatory that companies manufacturing new glucose lowering therapies demonstrate their cardiovascular safety before they could be marketed. And interestingly, this whole concern arose really from a mistake. There was an incorrect concern that rosiglitazone uh, increased the risk of atherothrombotic events, stroke, particularly myocardial infarction, cardiovascular death. But in fact, as it turns out, rosiglitazone didn't do that. But what it did do and what was completely ignored in the FDA guidance or largely ignored in the FDA guidance was, of course, heart failure. And in fact, what rosiglitazone very clearly did do was double the risk of developing heart failure. So patients with type 2 diabetes randomized in the record trial, which was my very first diabetes outcome trial, uh, rosiglitazone doubled the risk of developing heart failure. And in fact, the FDA guidance required that sponsors demonstrate safety in terms of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction and stroke, so-called MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, but did not require 
demonstration of safety in relation to heart failure, which in fact, in many studies, is the most common cardiovascular complication of type 2 diabetes, certainly the most deadly, and I would argue the most disabling. So it was a, rather a disappointment. But anyway, the story has turned out well in the end. But what happened as a result of that new guidance in 2008 was that there was an explosion of cardiovascular outcome trials, which I've attempted to summarize on this slide. It was an extremely difficult slide to keep up to date because there's so much happening in the field of diabetes with new drugs. But you can see here the completed trials and most of the uh, large ongoing cardiovascular outcome trials. In fact, ironically, for example, one of the oldest, in fact, the oldest treatment that we have for treating diabetes, insulin, we only got information about the cardiovascular safety of insulin, and in particular in relation to the risk of heart failure related to insulin treatment because of that FDA guidance, because of course, any new formulation of insulin had to be tested uh, for cardiovascular safety. And in one of those trials, in the ORIGIN trial, you can see here, in fact, that insulin treatment certainly wasn't associated with an increased risk of developing heart failure. And that may not be generally true of insulin in patients with established heart failure, but at least some reassurance about insulin, about which I think there had been some safety concern. But what about the newer drugs, which is really what this guidance was about? So let's start with the very first of these new classes of glucose lowering therapies that were tested in cardiovascular outcome trials. And those are the DPP4 inhibitors or glyptins drugs that break down uh, the, uh, uh, inhibit the enzyme that breaks down GLP1, that enzyme is dipeptoheptase or DPP4. There have been five large DPP4 inhibitor cardiovascular outcome trials. Four of those were placebo controlled trials. And you can see those four placebo controlled trials summarized in this figure. And ironically, the very first of this new wave of cardiovascular outcome trials actually showed a significant increase in the risk of developing heart failure. And that was with a drug called saxagliptin. But in fact, the subsequent placebo controlled trials with drugs in this class did not show a, a, did not confirm that increased risk in heart failure. But these drugs showed absolutely no beneficial effect on any cardiovascular outcome. You can see the three point MACE, CV death, MI, or stroke, heart failure, definitely no benefits. And then, as I said, there was a fifth trial with the DPP4 inhibitor. This was an interesting study. It's the most recent of these trials. It was a, an active control trial. So it compared linagliptin to a sulfonylurea, one of the traditional glucose lowering therapies. So this study was published last year. Uh, you can see the details here, but essentially this was a study in patients with type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk because of a number of different reasons. For example, having established cardiovascular disease, having multiple risk factors, being older. And this is a very interesting table because here you can see the linagliptin treated patients, the glimepiride treated patients, so the sulfonylurea treated patients. Here you see the different endpoints that were reported. So these are expressed as a rate for 100 person years. If you look at the control group, which is the sulfonylurea treated group, if you look down this list, if you look at the rate of events, actually, once again, you can see that in terms of individual cardiovascular events, in fact, heart failure is the most common cardiovascular complication in these patients. But you can also see that there is absolutely no difference between linagliptin a new glucose lowering therapy, and glimepiride, one of the older fashioned glucose lowering therapies. So sort of some indirect evidence that sulfonylureas may be safe from a cardiovascular perspective, 
in patients with type 2 diabetes, not patients with heart failure, but in patients with type 2 diabetes, many of which had atherothrombotic cardiovascular disease. But there is a huge puzzle here because, believe it or not, these are by far the most widely prescribed of the new glucose lowering therapies that we have available. There are three classes of new glucose lowering therapy. One of those three classes has absolutely no cardiovascular benefits. That's the DPP4 inhibitors. Yet, ironically, paradoxically, they are the most commonly used treatment. And that's something we can do about it. We've got to take ownership of diabetes. We've got to take ownership of treating patients with cardiovascular disease and diabetes and treating them with drugs that reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. And DPP4 inhibitors are unequivocally not those drugs. And yet, as I'm sure is the case in Egypt, in most countries in the world, they are the most commonly prescribed. So the second group of the new glucose lowering therapies I want to quickly review are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Some people would argue, in fact, that these are really two distinct groups of drugs. They act as GLP-1 agonists, but they've got fundamentally different pharmacological structures. Some are based on human GLP-1, some are based on Exendin-4. And again, we have a large number of trials here. Here you can see the major large cardiovascular outcome trials for the whole range of these agents. And then more recently, there was a fascinating smaller study, fascinating because it used an oral GLP-1 receptor agonist. These drugs had until this point all been injectable agents. So that perhaps made them less popular with patients, but here was evidence that at least one of these drugs could be administered as an oral formulation. And in fact, in this uh, relatively small study, was even associated with a significant reduction in cardiovascular death. Probably chance finding, probably very good luck, but we'll find out as I'll show you in a moment for sure. But if we put all of these trials together in a meta-analysis, it's very clear that these drugs reduce atherothrombotic events. So by that, I mean stroke, myocardial infarction, and the risk of cardiovascular death. And indeed, in the meta-analysis, reduction in overall mortality. So this is very different than the story with DPP4 inhibitors. And interestingly, overall, these drugs appear to lead to a very small reduction in the development of heart failure in incident new onset heart failure, although that is largely driven by a trial we did called Harmony Outcomes, in which alveglutide had a particularly large benefit on acute myocardial infarction. We think that this reduction in heart failure probably reflects the upstream reduction in myocardial injury at the time of infarction. But definitely very worthwhile drugs and elevated now to a priority treatment in the new diabetes guidelines that have come out in Europe and North America. But I said that we would learn more about this oral preparation of one of these drugs, semaglutide. And there is now, as you can see here, a very large study underway nearly 10,000 patients with the oral formulation of semaglutide looking at cardiovascular outcomes. And although, as always, heart failure is not the primary uh, outcome in this trial, it will be an adjudicated reported cardiovascular outcome. And in fact, there's a whole host of new trials with GLP-1 receptor agonists underway, including this really interesting study, massive study, uh, 17 and a half thousand patients uh, with the injectable form of semaglutide, not in patients with type 2 diabetes, but in obese and overweight patients looking at cardiovascular outcomes. So a huge amount going on with this class of drugs, although sadly not in patients with heart failure. 
And then one other related drug, just to mention in passing, this is a drug that is not just a GLP-1 receptor agonist, but it's also a GIP agonist. And this agent, again, is being studied in a very large cardiovascular outcome trial. So huge amount going on in this area. And then the last of the new classes of glucose-lowering therapies uh, that have been introduced in recent years to treat type 2 diabetes are the SGLT2 inhibitors. These drugs that inhibit the proximal tubular reabsorption of filtered glucose, cause glucosuria, cause loss of glucose, loss of calories, lower blood glucose. And they've been studied in a whole series of trials. There were four large broad spectrum cardiovascular outcome trials, four studies, including a broad range of patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk factors or a mix of those two. So they all had slightly different populations. And earlier this year, the fourth of these trials, the versus CV study reported. So now we've got a complete set of these trials. Of course, the primary outcome again was this MACE composite endpoint. And you can see here, overall, there was a sort of modest, if you put these trials into meta-analysis, there is a modest and significant reduction in the MACE outcome. But starting with Empereg outcome and finishing with versus, what these four trials sequentially, chronologically showed us, and I think it was a surprise initially to a lot of people, that SGLT2 inhibitors reduce heart failure hospitalization and reduce heart failure hospitalization substantially. Now, most of these trials did not include any patients with heart failure. On average, about 90% of patients did not have heart failure. And of the 10 or so percent of patients who did have heart failure, it was very poorly characterized. We really don't know much about it. But there was a significant reduction in heart failure hospitalization. We believe primarily this reflects a reduction in new onset incident heart failure, but it occurred very quickly. That benefit from heart failure hospitalization was seen almost within weeks of randomization in these trials, and as you can see, was remarkably consistent. And that evidence has continued. So there was another uh, family of these trials uh, set up in patients with chronic kidney disease. These drugs also reduce the risk of worsening renal function. The first of these trials has already reported credence, and that trial showed a reduction in its primary renal endpoint, but it also showed once again a substantial 30% reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization very clear, even larger reduction just when you look at heart failure hospitalization by itself. And as you probably know very recently, the second of this family of trials with these drugs in patients with chronic kidney disease, different study this time because it included patients without diabetes as well as patients with diabetes. This second renal trial, DAPA-CKD, has also just finished, it was stopped early for benefits. It's being presented in about 10 days time at the European Society of Cardiology Congress. You can see this press release from last month telling us that there was a reduction in the primary renal endpoint. There was a reduction in the secondary cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization endpoint. And indeed there was a reduction in overall mortality. We don't know the details, but remarkable benefits. In fact, the first ever drug to reduce all cause mortality in patients with chronic kidney disease. So very consistent benefits. And then just to finish this section of my presentation, there will be more to come because of course, the patients who are most at risk of developing future heart failure patients who've suffered substantial myocardial infarction. And going back many years when I was a young trainee in cardiology, uh, 
this school of trials reported in quick succession showing the remarkable benefits of ACE inhibitors in patients like this. And now we have two large acute myocardial infarction trials uh, getting underway with SGLT2 inhibitors. I don't think either of these trials have started. They're slated to start in the next few weeks, but you can see their design summarized here and you can look them up if you're interested. So much more to come in terms of the potential value of these drugs in preventing the development of heart failure. But I'm now going to switch to the other point I want to briefly discuss, and that's now not the prevention of new heart failure, but the treatment of patients with existing heart failure. And there are two sides to that coin. There's the treatment of diabetes in patients who've got heart failure, and then there's the treatment of heart failure in patients who've got diabetes. So do the drugs that we use to treat heart failure, do they work? as well in patients with diabetes as in patients without diabetes. Is it safe to use all the drugs we have to lower glucose in patients who have heart failure as well as type 2 diabetes? So there's really not so much to say in this part of my presentation because frankly we know next to nothing about what you might call the old glucose lowering therapies, sulfonylureas, metformin, insulin, we know next to nothing about their safety, certainly nothing about their efficacy in patients with established heart failure. And sadly, that is also true for the new glucose lowering therapies as well, with one exception, which is the SGLT2 inhibitors. We don't know very much about DPP4 inhibitors. We know next to nothing about GLP1 receptor agonists in patients with established heart failure. And here I'm focusing mainly on patients with FRF. Now, normally at this point, people giving this sort of presentation then start to talk about small studies or observational data sets. They really don't tell us anything that's useful. But the one group of drugs that we do know about using in patients with established heart failure, of course, are the SGLT2 inhibitors. These drugs prevent the development of heart failure we also now know that they can be used to treat heart failure, they can be used to treat diabetes in patients with heart failure, but they are a treatment for heart failure itself. We know that because of the DAPI-HF trial, which I'm not going to go through in detail. I think you all know about this. It's summarized in this slide, but dapi closing in a large population of patients with HEF-REF with and without type 2 diabetes reduced the primary comes to end points, indeed reduced heart failure hospitalization, reduced cardiovascular and all cause mortality. Each of those significantly improved symptoms as well. And no matter what endpoint we looked at, this was the case. We delved into the whole issue of is this just a drug for patients uh, who've got type 2 diabetes? or can it be used in heart failure patients without type 2 diabetes? The evidence is very clear that this treatment is beneficial even in patients without type 2 diabetes. So it is both a diabetes treatment, it is a heart failure treatment as well, and of course it's the perfect treatment for somebody who has both of these problems together. Those people shown here, very high risk, substantial relative and absolute risk reductions with dapagliflozin. It's now been approved in many countries around the world, first in the US, but now in multiple different countries as a treatment for heart failure as well as, well as a treatment for type 2 diabetes. And it's really important that you understand that this was a completely different study than those earlier trials that I talked about and that many people know about, those earlier trials had completely different patient population. If you look here at the rates per hundred, sorry, per thousand person years of follow-up for the composite of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, here you see it, for example, in the DECLARE TIMI 58 study, uh, which enrolled patients with type 2 diabetes, 
and either a cardiovascular risk factors or established cardiovascular disease, and now compare that to DAPHF. Patients in DAPHF had more than 10 times the risk of individuals in the DECLARE study. And if you look at patients with type 2 diabetes in DAPHF, it was even more than that. So patients in DAPHF were really in a different league in terms of their risk. And the benefits were really substantial in absolute terms. That's HEF-REF. We're getting, uh, we will get more information about HEF-REF again in about 10 days' time when the Emperor reduced study reports. This is using a different SGLT2 inhibitor. The study's got quite a different design. I haven't got time to go into that in detail, but really complicated in terms of how you could get into this study. You had to sort of fulfill both ejection fraction and natriuretic peptide criteria that made enrollment really quite difficult. So I said there are two sides to this coin. I've talked about what we know, which is relatively little, about glucose-lowering therapies in heart failure. What about whether or not drugs that we give to patients for heart failure work as well in patients with heart failure uh, uh, sorry, in patients with diabetes as in patients without diabetes? And the answer is, by and large, they do. Uh, I, with some colleagues a while ago, written a very extensive chapter in a textbook about this with a lot of original data in here, uh, delving into all the trials we've got with all the different therapies. And a quick summary of it is, that probably with the exception of implantable cardiovascular defibrillators, most drugs and devices probably work pretty much as well in patients with diabetes as without diabetes. There is some evidence that that might not be true for implantable uh, cardiovascular defibrillators, uh, but uh, no doubt <coughs> we can discuss that later if you want. There is one treatment that may have something unique to offer, and that is sucuptral valsartan. Uh, this is not Professor Severovich, who's going to speak to us very shortly, but his daughter, who, when she was working with Scott Solomon in Boston, so we're all part of a big family, uh, wrote this very nice paper from Paradigm Heart Failure, showing that compared to malapril sucuptral valsartan, significantly reduced hemoglobin A1C. More importantly, reduced the need for these patients with type 2 diabetes to start new insulin therapy. In fact, reduced that need for starting new insulin therapy by about 30%. The relative risk reduction here, as you can see, is 29%. That's very important. You don't want to be on insulin less. You have to. If you start insulin, that is prognostically bad news. So this was a very interesting finding. We don't really know its full explanation. It might simply be because sucuptral valsartan stops patients' heart failure getting worse compared to a RAS blocker alone. Uh, but it may also be because uh, actually one of the substrates for nephrolysin is GLP-1. So just like DPP-4, Nephrolysin breaks down GLP-1. If you inhibit nephrolysin with sucubitril, you increase GLP-1. So in a way, it probably acts like a DPP-4 inhibitor. And it also slows progression of renal function over time, especially in patients with diabetes. So the steady, relentless decline in GFR over time that characterizes heart failure, especially if you have concomitant diabetes, that is slowed by sucuptral valsartan compared to a RAS blocker alone. So perhaps some specific benefits in type 2 diabetes in one of those two treatments. So I spend a lot of time talking about HEF-REF. The reason I haven't talked about HEF-PEF is because we really have even less evidence in HEF-PEF. We don't really know how to treat it. Uh, with cardiovascular drugs, and we certainly don't know how to treat patients with hep, hep who also have type 2 diabetes. We will get some evidence, maybe as early as next 
March at the American College of Cardiology with Emperor Preserve presents. So there are two big SGLT2 inhibitor trials in patients with HEPF, but really that will be it. That's the only evidence we can look forward to. Uh, I will dwell on that side. So I've raced through this. I hope I've got across what an amazing period has been in the de development of uh, therapeutics for type 2 diabetes as well as heart failure. And at least we've got some treatments that can do a lot of good for patients who have, who have both of those problems together. And of course, that combination places those patients at tremendously high risk. And we can reduce that risk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor John, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, now uh, I have the pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor uh, Scott Solomon, uh, Edward uh, Frolic, uh, Distinguished Chair, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, uh, Director of uh, Non-Invasive Cardiology and Senior Physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, Professor Solomon is the primary investigator for many landmark trials in the field of heart failure and Baragon HF trial, one of these trials. Professor uh, Scott, go ahead. Uh, please, uh, Professor Scott, can you? Yeah. Unmute. <laughs> Thank you very much. I very much appreciate the invitation. When I saw the invitation to give a talk in Egypt, I was very excited because I thought I would get to see the pyramids, but <laughs> not this time. Uh, maybe, maybe next time uh, we'll get there. Um, so I'm very sorry we can't all be uh, in person. Um, I'm going to talk about the unmet need in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And um, uh, here are my disclosures. And I don't think I need to tell anybody in this audience that uh, heart failure is uh, a burden to about 26 million people worldwide. The prevalence is increasing, and that is occurring because our population is aging, and heart failure is a disease of aging. In addition, the treatments of heart failure have been improving, as Dr. McMurray has told you about as I will tell you about, we've actually gotten pretty good at treating patients with heart failure. And so patients are living longer. When they live longer, they're uh, more likely to have heart failure hospitalizations. And this, of course, further increases the costs and the burden to the healthcare system as a whole. Now, the outcomes, unfortunately, uh, in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in terms of readmitted, being readmitted to the hospital are actually relatively poor. And if we look at the readmission rates for either cardiovascular readmissions or heart failure readmissions, we see that uh, on average, there are about 64% for cardiovascular readmissions over a five-year period and 49% for heart failure readmissions. Now these are higher in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but they're still pretty high even in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The survival of patients with heart failure is also uh, dramatically lower than their counterparts without heart failure. And if we look at the average survival and this is, um, uh, of course, in the United States, from my own country, of patients between the age of 65 and 69, it's 18.7 years. These are people uh, who are free of heart failure. That's the overall life expectancy. But in a heart failure patient, and it really doesn't matter very much if it's heart failure with reduced or preserved ejection fraction, we're talking about three to four years in that age group. And as the age gets even higher, uh, that number goes down fairly precipitously as well. So what are the overall goals of heart failure treatment? I think we can all agree they are to improve uh, patients' clinical status, improve their functional capacity, that is what they can do, 
improve their quality of life, how they feel, prevent admissions to the hospital, and ultimately also reduce mortality. Now, we've been very fortunate, especially in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, that we really do have many therapies that have been proven to benefit patients. And, and, and this proof has come from randomized clinical trials over the past two decades. They're not just therapies that make people feel better, but truly modify disease, modify the course of disease and improve mortality. And these include, of course, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, RNAs, beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and now the new kid on the block that Dr. McMurray just told you about, SGLT2 inhibitors. In addition, of course, we treat patients empirically uh, and symptomatically uh, who have heart failure. We relieve congestion, primarily with loop diuretics. And then in certain groups of patients, what I would call niche groups of patients, we have other proven therapies. For example, in black patients, hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate has been proven to be beneficial even on top of other disease modifying therapies. We have for patients who have persistent elevation in heart rate despite optimal beta blockade, uh, evabradine, which is a pure heart rate reducing therapy. This of course has led to many international guidelines, the American College, American Heart, HFSA guidelines, the European guidelines, the Canadian guidelines, the Japanese guidelines. And I'm not going to go through all of the individual guidelines. Each of them has a algorithm somewhat like this. And there are differences between all of the different guidelines from the different societies, but there are also uh, important similarities uh, in terms of what we all do uh, and we, we all consider evidence-based in our patients with heart failure. And of course, um, uh, many of us, I think, believe that this uh, stepwise approach is, which is uh, illustrated here from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart, HFSA guidelines, is pretty much what most of us do in practice with some degree of, of, of variability. In addition to medications, it's important to note that there are devices that have been proven to benefit patients with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, CRT, uh, ICD, and of course, in the most advanced patients, uh, LVADs as well. The challenge, I think, has been that although we have multiple guidelines, uh, we have clinical practice updates uh, being published almost monthly, morbidity and mortality remains high in patients with heart failure. And, and that is at least in part because there are a very large percentage of patients who are not receiving guideline-directed therapy. And I'm just gonna illustrate that by showing you some data with, uh, from a number of um, uh, uh, sources, including the Get With the Guidelines from 2011-2012, ERIC, the Atherosclerosis Risk Community, Reality, AHF, and basically what they all show is that at the time of hospital discharge, um, many patients are leaving the hospital. And this is, of course, the point at which we really have most control over what they're doing. They're leaving the hospital not on the guideline-directed therapies that virtually all the societies agree we should be treating our patients with. In addition, if they're on the right medicines, they may not be on the right doses. And these data uh, from Stephen Green suggest that uh, patients who are even on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, beta blockers, MRAs, are often on suboptimal doses of those medications. Remember, the trials from which we have data have always optimized uh, the doses. Uh, there's no question that better adherence to guideline-directed therapies lead to better outcomes in heart failure with 
reduced ejection fraction, as has been shown in a number of studies, including uh, this one published by Dr. Kamajda. Now, um, we did hear a little bit uh, earlier about Sacubitril valsartan. And as you know, this is a, um, a, a drug that Dr. McMurray and I have been studying for about 10 years. It's a crystalline compound that is um, composed of equal molar amounts of valsartan and sacubitril. Sacubitril turns into sacubitril at once it's ingested. Uh, both of these parts come apart. Valsartan blocks the AT1 receptor. Sacubitril at blocks neprilysin. And neprilysin is an enzyme that is responsible uh, for the breakdown of the biologically active natriuretic pe peptides, including ANP, BNP, CMP, but also a whole host of other natriuretic peptide, uh, other vasoactive peptides, including adrenomedulin, bradykinin, substance P, angiotensin. And when you give sacubitril valsartan, you're both blocking the renin angiotensin system and you're augmenting the naturally occurring vasoactive peptide system. And as you uh, know well, in the paradigm study, uh, we demonstrated a 20% reduction in a primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, 20% reduction in cardiovascular death, both very highly significant, and a 16% reduction in all-cause mortality when comparing sacubitril valsartan to the standard of care enalapril. Now, um, since Paradigm, there have been many additional publications. I was looking this up today, and our original Paradigm team has published about 70 uh, subsequent publications, and um, uh, the rest of the world has uh, filled in the other gaps. There have been now close to a thousand publications on Sacubitril valsartan. When we published Paradigm, there were only 13 publications. Um, despite that, however, adoption of this therapy, which of course received approvals in most countries around the world within about a year to two after the publication of the Paradigm results, this adoption was actually quite uh, slow. And uh, shown here uh, are some uh, data from the U.S., but you can see there's a relatively slow uptake of um, the use of the ARNI sacubitril valsartan in patients who were eligible for the use of sacubitril valsartan. And um, it's gotten better. I mean, we're seeing now on the order of 25% use in eligible patients in the United States. I'm not sure what that's like in other places. Now, there are other things that we should be doing with our heart failure patients, of course, that are really easy and uh, quite straightforward. And especially now in the setting of a global pandemic, we have to be extremely vigilant about ensuring that our patients who are vulnerable uh, get uh, uh, vaccinated for influenza and uh, appropriate patients pneumococcal vaccine as well. These are data also from Paradigm, simply looking at the percentage of patients who actually got vaccinated for influenza with heart failure. And virtually all guidelines suggest that heart failure patients should be vaccinated. And you can see that it ranged dramatically. Unfortunately, we didn't have Egypt in uh, the paradigm trial, so I can't tell you what the numbers are there, but this is an intervention that is extremely inexpensive. It's very effective, and our patients who are vulnerable with heart failure who get influenza are going to um, do much worse. There's no question about that. The barriers to the use of guideline directed medical therapy are multiple. Uh, the patients may not want to uh, have more medications. Providers uh, may not want to take the time to discuss with the patients. There are maybe issues with respect to the healthcare system, costs, and so forth. Um, now, I'm going to very briefly um, just talk a little bit about something that Dr. McMurray did touch on, which is the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, in patients with heart failure. And as you know and you heard, SGLT2 inhibitors reduce glucose absorption in the proximal tubule leading to urinary glucose excretion and osmotic diuresis, 
And um, although we don't know absolutely for sure why these drugs both prevent the development of heart failure and seem to be able to treat patients with heart failure, we are now quite convinced based on the data that uh, we've seen from the DAP-HF trial. And I'm gonna show you very quickly, again, the primary results that Dr. McMurray already showed, a 26% reduction in a compositive cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, or urgent heart failure visit with dapagliflozin, a number needed to treat of 21 patients over 24 months. And you can see all of these secondary endpoints also significant, including all-cause mortality and cardiovascular death. Um, very safe, a very um, uh, impressive safety profile in this trial um, with uh, virtually no adverse events of interest that were greater in the dapagliflozin group than in the placebo group. Uh, enormous consistency across all pre-specified endpoints, and Dr. McMurray has already shown you the data regarding those patients with and without type 2 diabetes, virtually the exact same result. If you have diabetes or you don't have diabetes, I'm going to show you one other subgroup that was not pre-specified but post hoc, but we have published this recently, which is the sacubitril valsartan patients. About 11% of the patients in DAP-HF took sacubitril valsartan, and their, uh, the effect of DAP, uh, dapagliflozin was similar uh, whether or not these patients were taking sacubitril valsartan. Now, the interpretation of this is not that uh, if you're on dapagliflozin, you don't need to take sacubitril valsartan or vice versa. In fact, it's the opposite. The interpretation is that there should be incremental benefit to being on both of these medications. And we've recently um, published a, uh, an analysis which essentially estimated that incremental benefit if we took a patient uh, and put them on all the comprehensive disease-modifying pharmacologic therapy. So patients who are already on beta blockers, on ACE inhibitors or ARB, switched them to an ARNI, added a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, added an SGLT2 inhibitor. And although this is not a real trial, it is estimated, we are able to estimate that we should see about a 62% reduction in risk of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, a 50% reduction in cardiovascular death, uh, 42% reduction in heart failure hospitalization, and a 53% reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, that is quite impressive if, in fact, we can do that. And if we look at that in terms of a metric that patients can understand, what is the lifetime benefit uh, if they are on comprehensive therapy? We can see that an average 55-year-old would, on um, conventional therapy, live an average of 6.4 years, but on comprehensive therapy, 14.7 years. So that's an 8.3 year difference. And a 64 year old, five year old would have a 6.3 year difference. This is something we can tell to our patients. Finally, there are some new things on the horizon uh, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We will be hearing uh, hopefully, the American Heart Association, the results of the, uh, of the galactic trial with omacamptiv macarbal. Omacamptiv macarbal is a novel selective cardiac myosin activator. And it's, uh, it, it actually um, increases the contractile force of the myocardium. It's really unique. We hope that it will do this safely. We have data from a pilot trial that shows improvement in a number of parameters of left ventricular function and left ventricular remodeling, um, as well as NT pro BNP. And the galactic trial will be uh, presented, hopefully, at the American Heart Association. It's a very large 8,200 patient heart failure trial. In the end of the day, we do have to think about the fact that many of the medicines that we use.
in, um, in, in heart failure have a cost. And uh, this is what my friend and colleague John Tierlin calls a spending function. In other words, we only have so much blood pressure, so much heart rate, uh, GFR, we don't want potassium to go too high. And many of the drugs that we use um, do have an effect there. So we do have to titrate these therapies individually to our individual patients. And interestingly, some of the newer agents um, may have less of an effect in some of these areas than others. So ARNIs, for example, have less of an effect on potassium and um, GFR than do ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Um, STLT2 inhibitors um, really are fairly neutral with respect to many of these uh, effects. And the myosin activator, well, we'll see what happens in terms of efficacy, but we wouldn't expect to see those kinds of issues with um, blood pressure, potassium, or GFR, making it potentially a very interesting uh, addition to our armamentarium. So in summary, patients with HEFREF are at high risk for cardiovascular events. Um, optimizing treatment remains a therapeutic goal, but has been challenging for multiple reasons, including the fact that we now have multiple drugs that we have to juggle in these patients. Um, there's still an unmet met need, even in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which I call the uh, epitome of evidence-based medicine. There's still room for optimal improvement, and we're going to keep trying uh, to find new therapies to help these patients in need. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Scott Saruman, for this, uh, this highly informative presentation. Uh, the discussion at the end of uh, the session. So I have the pleasure now to introduce uh, uh, Professor Peter Severovich. Professor Peter is the immediate past president of the Heart Failure Association, and currently he is a vice president of the European Society of Cardiology. Professor Sivirovich is a professor of cardiology, University of Belgrade, Faculty of Medicine, and the Heart Failure Center, Belgrade University, Academician Serbian Academy of Science and Arts. He's the president of the Heart Failure Society in Serbia. I'd like uh, to thank Professor Peter and appreciating his great help and support to the Egyptian Society of Cardiology and the excellent collaboration with the Heart Failure Association. Professor Sibirovich is going to talk about a very important topic in heart failure, which is sudden death in heart failure, uh, which uh, we can uh, use drugs, devices, or surgery. Professor Sibirovich. Okay, I try to share screen. Um, stop share, okay. Share screen. I could not get to the. I could not get to the. Yes. Slide show. We are seeing now the uh, slides. slides. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It is my great pleasure to be again with you. We were very successful in the past. We had uh, several uh, very important activities, and I am always impressed by the way of the high knowledge and uh, scientific information of the Egyptian uh, cardiologist. Uh, I am going to address one of the most frightening and probably most uh, dangerous topics in uh, heart failure and uh, this is uh, the problem of the sudden death in the patient with HFREF. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as it was said several times, sudden cardiac death is uh, something uh, which is unexpected event in the patient with heart failure. However, it should be always expected, recognizing uh, the threat of uh, dying of the, from, from uh, this entity in the patient with HFREF. Uh, obviously, looking at the epidemiological data, we can clearly see that uh, 
uh, almost a third of our patients uh, are dying uh, from the sudden cardiac death. So one of the ma major problems is obviously uh, pump heart failure. Then uh, there are other non-CV uh, causes, but sudden cardiac death is something like 35.2%, and these are uh, the paradigm data. If we turn to the real world data, uh, in the new, uh, newly diagnosed heart failure, we can clearly see that uh, one fifth, around 25, 22% of the patient may die suddenly. And uh, this is uh, something uh, which uh, completely obscure our uh, successes in the field of improving um, uh, pumping function of the heart. Uh, going uh, through the time, uh, per, perhaps from the hospitalization for heart failure, the risk of sudden cardiac death is uh, gradually increases, uh, not only after the diagnosis of HFREF, going from, uh, from less than 1% to as high as uh, 7%. Every hospitalization for heart failure carries a high and increasing risk of sudden cardiac death. Obviously, heart failure hospitalization uh, are something uh, which, has, uh, which are associated with the risk of uh, sudden cardiac death. And uh, if we analyze the data from the RELAX acute heart failure study, uh, we can see that 23% of mortality of those uh, patients accounts for the ca sudden cardiac death. The, the obviously uh, out of all these patients, the highest number is accounts for the patient uh, with uh, HFREF. Uh, if you look at the mechanism of sudden cardiac death in HFREF uh, patient, Obviously, uh, the pathological substrate, substrate is something uh, which is uh, the most important, starting from the interstitial fibrosis and the replacement of myocardium with the scar. Uh, so these areas are the places when the arrhythmias can start, uh, which are practically triggered by the different events which may be seen as ischemia, then electrolytic disturbances, uh, sympathetic overactivity, QT prolongation, and the PVCs. It is obviously that in half a patient with new, New York Heart Association class 2 to 3, there is a lesser degree of uh, pathological substrate and uh, ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation are mostly the way how these patients are dying. However, if we look at advanced heart failure and severe left ventricular remodeling, then other mechanisms can be uh, responsible like uh, systole electromechanical dissociation and uh, co complete uh, atrioventricular block. Uh, obviously, there are different, uh, different uh, factors which uh, are important in uh, looking at the uh, incidence of sudden cardiac death. Left ventricular ejection fraction is the major determinant. And uh, in the patient uh, in whom the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is uh, less than 30%, so the sudden cardiac death may be as high as 7.5 percent, although the patient with uh, 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 better ejection fraction have much uh, better chances for, to the less incidence uh, of this uh, frightening event. However, if we look at the total proportion of the HFREF uh, patients, we may see that the proportion of the sudden cardiac death is actually higher in the less advanced heart failure. So in patient with New York Heart Association class two, uh, the proportion of the sudden cardiac death is as high as 64%, uh, going to the 33% in New York Heart uh, uh, Association class four. Uh, 
So these uh, differences uh, can be explained by triggering uh, the arrhythm arrhythmias in the patient uh, with the less advanced uh, heart failure. Uh, the different modalities in the treatment of heart failure, and this is uh, obviously something we need to talk about now, uh, encompasses uh, uh, medical therapy, devices, and surgery. All, all these modalities uh, should be used, and uh, among the drugs, beta blockers are on the first place. They have a significant uh, risk reduction in uh, sudden cardiac death, which goes up to 31%. And this meta-analysis of the 30 trials in almost 25,000 patients is showing that the beta blockers are very effective in uh, reducing sudden cardiac death. Uh, the way how we um, uh, started the medical therapy in patients with heart failure is also important. If we use a beta blocker first in those patients, uh, in comparison with the AC inhibitor, uh, the effect on risk reduction for the ca sudden cardiac death is uh, very high. And uh, as you can see from the uh, graph on the, on the left side, sudden cardiac death during the uh, entire study uh, was uh, much lower in the patient which uh, were started with uh, bisoprolol first in comparison with uh, enalapril. Therefore, uh, beta blockers are considered to be one of the important drugs in preventing sudden cardiac death. Uh, if we look at the mineralocorticoid receptor, the important uh, part of the triple therapy in uh, heart failure patients. Uh, the meta-analysis of the three randomized trials show that the re risk reduction with mineral mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist is uh, 23%. Uh, in the rail, cephesus, uh, and emphasis heart failure, this reduction was uh, clearly shown uh, demonstrating the importance of the triple therapy in the patient with uh, HFREF. Uh, if we look at the different ACE inhibitors and the meta-analysis of uh, uh, different randomized clinical trials, in the patient uh, post-myocardial infarction with a uh, clear left ventricular dysfunction, the risk reduction for sudden cardiac death uh, was 20% uh, in those who were using a AC inhibitors. Uh, Sacubitril varsartan was mentioning uh, several times here, and uh, very clearly and very early it was shown that uh, Sacubitril varsartan in the Paradigm trial was uh, reducing sudden cardiac death by 20% in comparison uh, with enalapril. Uh, sudden cardiac death uh, was due to the less VT and VF episodes and obviously less uh, ICD interventions. Uh, obviously, the way how this uh, uh, mechanism developed, and we, will, we are going to talk a little bit uh, more about that, is uh, to, to stop uh, rev reverse uh, remodeling in those patients. Uh, it is important uh, to know, and it was demonstrated in, in the several studies. This is a study in uh, 360 patients with non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy that left ventricular reverse modeling, which occurs in 37 of the patient on optimal med medical therapy during the, the two years, uh, was independent predictor of decreasing of the sudden cardiac death. This reverse cardiac modeling and outcome were also uh, shown in PROVEGF trial, in uh, whom the speed and magnitude of anti pro BNP was associated uh, with the uh, improved survival. Uh, therefore, the use of sacubitril varsartan is uh, clearly beneficial in reducing sudden cardiac death in patients with uh, HFREF. Uh, 
Uh, it is important uh, in uh, progressing to the next uh, the therapeutic step, uh, first to optimize the medical therapy uh, and then uh, make a decision, are we going to do the implantation or not? Uh, according to the data from the Meritage of Copernicus and uh, CBS2, uh, beta blockers uh, were extremely effective, but they do not impart any mortality benefit until at least three months. So they need uh, to, to be updated and they need to uh, get to the proper dosage in order that they can uh, act uh, properly. Uh, extension of the waiting period before ESC implantation is clear and uh, uh, optimized medical therapy uh, can take uh, time. Uh, obviously, competing risks of death can rise and also the risk of sudden, sudden cardiac death, which may be as high as uh, 7%. Uh, there is no a doubt that uh, optimal medical therapy is uh, reducing sudden cardiac death. If we look at the uh, different uh, drugs and the uh, different studies uh, during the last two decades, uh, we can roughly estimate that the rate of uh, sudden cardiac death was declined by the uh, medical therapy by 44%. Uh, the, some drugs uh, do, not, do not have the benefit in uh, those patients and uh, in, in reducing sudden, sudden cardiac death. And it is also important for us uh, to know that the newer drugs, uh, SGLT2, uh, who were uh, mentioning several times, uh, does not have also the effect or the effect needs uh, to be uh, proven in the future. Uh, the next step in treating this patient is to recognize uh, the possibility that the patient uh, be at a high risk of the sudden cardiac death and uh, apply uh, ICD or in the secondary prevention or in the primary prevention. Uh, many studies actually uh, demonstrated uh, the prevention, the benefit on both secondary and uh, primary prevention. Uh, not only the controls randomized trial, but also the real world data in uh, HFREF, uh, and uh, th that can apply on the registering the patient, uh, comparing ICD versus uh, MEDI2 patients on optimal medical therapy, as well as. Uh, the comparison of the, of the ICD uh, versus uh, uh, SCD have the patient on optimal medical therapy. So both uh, real world data demonstrated that uh, ICD is highly effective in uh, the patient who are at the high risk uh, for sudden cardiac death. It is obviously important uh, to try all possible medical interventions before we implant ICD or make the consideration for the ICD gener generator replacement. And the meta-analysis of the 16 studies on primary prevention of ICD uh, clearly show that if the left ventricular re re reverse remodeling is halted, uh, the ICD uh, generator re replacement may be done later or even uh, uh, left uh, for the, for the uh, uh, later period. Uh, it is uh, very clearly shown that there are sex, sex differences in the mode of sudden cardiac death in heart failure. And in analyzing uh, the HFREF patient for five randomized trials, the total number was around 8,000. Uh, the woman, the woman had a 30% lower uh, uh, risk for sudden cardiac death, but at any given total mortality, they had a 54% higher uh, 
risk for pump failure death. So this is also applies to the consideration for the ICD implantation uh, in the woman, uh, but it can uh, be uh, decisively uh, concluded that the woman derived significant benefit from primary ICD uh, implantation. Uh, obviously, the etiology of HFREF uh, is uh, something which uh, we discuss a lot, which we discuss a lot. Uh, Danish trial uh, put uh, forward uh, the controversy uh, in non-ischemic systolic uh, heart failure, showing that there is no uh, benefit uh, of implantation of the ICD in a non-ischemic uh, cardi cardiomyopathy. Uh, however, uh, the implication of age uh, uh, was uh, mentioned, and uh, at the end, the, uh, the younger patient, which uh, have uh, less than 70 years, uh, may derive the benefit from an implantation of the ICD, and uh, this is uh, due to the lower competing risk of uh, non-cardiovascular mortality. Therefore, at the end, uh, the data from the Danish trial were shown to be beneficial, but some uh, sub-analyses are, are demonstrating, demonstrating that the younger patients have benefited from the implantation of the ICD. Uh, in some cases, the reduction of sudden death with ICD does not translate into the reduction of the all-cause mortality. And uh, in those patients, uh, ICD is uh, not uh, indicated. Uh, at the end, uh, it should be underlined that uh, surgery may also have the uh, benefit in reducing the risk uh, uh, of the sudden cardiac death in uh, uh, HFREF patient. In uh, STITCH trial, uh, the, the relatively late benefit uh, was shown in comparison of CABG patient with medical therapy. Uh, it is clear that that was uh, due to the reduction of the severis chemic event and that the CABG was uh, uh, beneficial in comparison uh, with the medical treatment which uh, probably has uh, the uh, arrhythmogenic basis. At the end, ladies and gentlemen, it is important to do the proper risk certification of the patient with HFREF regarding sudden cardiac death. Uh, every patient uh, should be seen as an individual and assessing the risk depending on the etiology, depending on the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction and comorbidity is essential. It is important for us to, to underline that all these patients uh, should be seen as, uh, as one who may have the risk for sudden cardiac death and therefore, and therefore uh, fight it appropriately. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sivirovic, for uh, this uh, elegant presentation. Now it's a time for discussion. So I have a questions and also I have many questions from the audience. So I will start by asking Professor Jean McMurray regarding the, his presentation and the use of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in patients' heart failure. Uh, recently, there was a concern about the risk of ketoacidosis, uh, the, the tripling risk in patients uh, using SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, the uh, other question, uh, are we going to use it uh, as uh, add-on treatment in diabetic patients with heart failure or for all comers of heart failure patients? I'll do the second part first. So it's unquestionably a treatment for heart failure. You've got to think about this like um, sildenafil. It's a treatment for erectile dysfunction. But it's also a treatment for pulmonary hypertension. Think about minoxidil, it was an antihypertensive. 
It's now what I need to make my hair grow back. So lots of drugs are repurposed for other uses, other applications. And that is true of SGLT2 inhibitors. So they're treatment for heart failure, irrespective of whether people have got diabetes or not. The regulators agree with that, with us about that. I don't think there is any doubt uh, that that's the case. In terms of diabetic ketoacidosis, yes, there's a very small risk diabetic ketoacidosis. It is a tiny risk. You look at the rate of diabetic ketoacidosis, when you look at the rate of death, you're talking about a thousandfold difference. So we get fixated on things that are very rare. It's like thinking about angioedema with an ACE inhibitor. It's obviously important. You have to be aware of it. It does happen, but it's uncommon. There are no known cases in people who don't have diabetes. So it's not something you need to worry about in your non-diabetic heart failure patients. And in your diabetic heart failure patients, it's almost always in patients who are on insulin. Maybe there is more of a risk in people on insulin secretagogues like SUs, but it's mainly in insulin. And it's mainly when the insulin dose is reduced or withheld. So if somebody gets sick, they stop eating, stop drinking, their insulin dose is cut back, that's when they're at risk of ketoacidosis. So you have to know about that. You have to advise the patients accordingly. I don't know if you have in Egypt what we call sick day rules. In, in Europe, I think there's a different term in America, but we often have those for ACE inhibitors, ARBs. People get dehydrated, get sick, stop your treatment, restart it once you're over that acute illness. Going in for surgery and you have to fast, because you're having an operation, then you know stop the SGLT2 inhibitor. If you do all of that, it's very, very unlikely to be a problem. Uh, question for, uh, thank you very much, Professor. A question for Professor uh, Scott Solomon. Uh, you discussed the elegantly different classes of drugs for heart failure, established drugs and new emerging drugs. So the problem of uh, polypharmacy in patients with heart failure. So are we going uh, for the future for uh, a precision medicine? Which drug for which patients? Because we have a lot of different classes for patients with heart failure now. Right, well, so yes, the patients, uh, one of the burdens that I guess I didn't really talk about was polypharmacy, the fact that people have to take a lot of pills. Um, I consider that a relatively benign burden uh, if we can reduce their risk of hospitalization, make them feel better and reduce their risk of mortality. Uh, of course, we have to remember that older patients are more likely to get confused with their medications and the more medications, the more likely that is to happen. And so, um, you know, I would certainly be uh, very happy to see uh, combination therapies that uh, help reduce the pill count in our uh, elderly patients. Um, uh, and I think you're, what you're getting at is that we have, for the most part, not differentiated our, our, our therapies based on any particular type of phenotyping. Um, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, patients, regardless of their etiology, benefit from all the drugs that I talked about, whether that be beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, ARNIs, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and SGLT2 inhibitors, regardless of etiology, for the most part, they, they derive benefit from these therapies. So we, we haven't quite yet uh, uh, initiated personalized medicine in patients with HEFREF. Now, um, it's interesting, there are a few therapies that we have that are personalized in that they truly work only in people with a very specific phenotype. So, uh, CRT is a very good example of that. Patients with a left bundle branch block and a wide QRS uh, 
will benefit uniquely from cardiac resynchronization therapy. And I think what you're getting at um, is that we really should be thinking more about whether we can get to that point with, um, with multiple drugs. Now, what I, I ended my talk with, which is talking about this, what I call the spending function, um, that might be one way in which we end up uh, personalizing our, our, our therapies because we, we really do have to take into account what is the patient's blood pressure, what is their heart rate, uh, what is their potassium and what is their creatinine when treating them. And um, that uh, has guided us, I think, to substitute some drugs from, for others uh, and to be more personal. One example is that uh, there's no question that if you want to get a patient on a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist who's not, you should you should switch them from an ACE inhibitor and ARB to sacubitril valsartan because the risk of severe hyperkalemia is 40% higher on, with a patient who's already on enalapril and gets uh, an MRA compared to a patient who's on sacubitril valsartan and gets an MRA. So that's one example of what I would call personalized um, uh, approach to medicine. But we, we do this all the time in, in, in one way or another, and we're going to get better at it for sure. And Scott, I completely agree. For example, ibuprofen is another drug it's targeted to people with a persistently high heart rate. So I think we're really good at this in heart failure. We just don't, haven't recognized and haven't called it that. Yeah. Great, great, excellent. Professor Severovich, uh, uh, is there a role for imaging in identifying patients at high risk for sudden death, like CMR, for example, before sending patients to ICD implantation? Of course, of course. Uh, the, this is very important, and uh, imaging is getting uh, uh, more and more within the different aspects of the heart failure. Uh, one of an excellent example is, is uh, the uh, uh, definition of the inflammatory lesion on myocardium, which uh, may be uh, a kind of uh, myocarditis, which can lead to the sudden cardiac death due to the arrhythmias. On the other hand, uh, CMR is also important in uh, identifying the uh, places when ischemia is ongoing or when ischemia is uh, present because uh, this is a high risk for uh, for developing uh, arrhythmias as well as you know uh, all the newer imaging method has an excellent uh, possibility of assessing uh, left ventricular ejection fraction but also diastolic dysfunction in those patients and therefore all of this using in a particular patient if we need because uh, the echocardiography is uh, something which is uh, in the first line we use uh, in, in all these patients. Uh, therefore, it is important uh, to uh, do the proper st risk stratification uh, using imaging method we have and which is routinely uh, used in, in, uh, in everyday clinical practice. Great. Great. Professor uh, Joe McMurray, regarding uh, SGLT2 inhibitor uh, compared with diuretics, it decreases heart failure hospitalization. Is it volume regulation that is different from uh, diuretics? Uh, the mechanism for uh, interstitial volume, blood volume, what, what is behind this? I can see my colleagues all laughing because they know that I've got the hard question. Um, so I, I think SGLT2 inhibitors definitely regulate volume differently. So we published a paper like four years or three years ago about that. Um, but that's, I mean, that's one question, but whether that is anything to do with the way these drugs exert their beneficial effect, I truthfully don't know. I mean, the diuresis appears to be short-lived. There's a lot of 
debate about this, which surprised me, but had to look into it for various reasons recently. And some studies show that this diuresis lasts only a few days, some perhaps up to a couple of weeks, but it's, it's very modest, it's very short lived. It may be relevant, of course, but if it is relevant, it's probably relevant earlier. And that then creates this interesting notion that a drug might act at one point in time through one mechanism and at another point in time later through different mechanisms. So I, I don't know that speculation, but I think it would be hard to believe that this is just about diuresis, although it's possible. And some people have said to me, well, look at the uh, champion study with the CardioMEMS device. Uh, that was largely a study where the intervention based on pulmonary artery pressure monitoring was increasing dose of diuretic and adding vasodilators, but mainly changing diuretic. So they say that there is some evidence that diuretics may have beneficial effects, although that benefit was exclusively on heart failure hospitalization. We saw more than that, we saw a reduction in cardiovascular death. So personally, I would think it's hard to believe it's just diuretic, uh, but you know what? I don't care. I don't think I know really how any drug works. I like to speculate, we all <laughs> love to show those nice mechanistic diagrams, but actually my patient doesn't come in and say to me, you know, uh, doctor, is this drug going to change my myocardial metabolism or is it going to affect my sodium hydrogen exchanger? They want to know whether it make them feel better, live longer and stay out of hospital. And that's what matters and that's what it does. John, I can call I can call that to be extremely modest. So you don't care about the mechanism, but that drug drug wars and that's enough. That's, yeah. that's honestly how I do feel. Absolutely. I, I call it I call it Thank you. Professor Scott Solomon uh, regarding uh, psychometry valsartan. We know that paradigm uh, inclusion criteria have failure patients function class two to four. What about the use of the drug in function class one, naive patients? Is it uh, patients with EF 38%, NIHA function class one, anti-bro NB mildly elevated? What do you think for this patient? Well, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of data on these patients, although there were some patients in Paradigm who uh, ended up being in class one uh, by the time they were randomized. And John, you may remember the exact I number. I, it's, it's, not, it's not a lot. Um, but, you know, the idea of treating patients with asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction is interesting. Now, um, I believe that if you actually um, were really careful about taking a history in many of these patients, you would elicit symptoms that uh, that you might not have seen otherwise. And so we, we have to be very careful that uh, these patients, re, you know, there may not be that much of a difference between class one and, and, and class two patients um, if you actually uh, either do some provocative testing or, or really ask them what their symptoms are because uh, we, we tend to be less than perfect about that. But uh, I believe that this drug is disease modifying, uh, that we have now um, data from a number of studies that it, it uh, attenuates progressive ventricular remodeling, might even result in reverse remodeling and improvement in ejection fraction. And so I, I think it might be beneficial. And um, we are um, testing this currently in a post-MI trial. Uh, not quite the population you're talking about, but it is a trial in which we're going to be testing that in a group of patients who are at risk for heart failure, but haven't necessarily yet uh, joined the heart failure club. Uh, that's the Paradise MI trial. Uh, so we will see. Um, currently, uh, class one is not a indication, but um, I think many of us believe uh, 
that uh, it's really a pretty small leap of faith to get there. John, what do you think about that? Well, in um, October at the Heart Failure Society of America, we will present a cardiac MRI left ventricular remodeling study and it's got lots of other measures in patients who have got a low ejection fraction, who have no symptoms, and who are randomized to either scupro valsartan or valsartan. So we will get some evidence, it won't be, it's not an outcome study, but it is it's a pretty good study in terms of cardiac function, biomarkers, etc. So we'll have some evidence in that population very shortly. Okay. I have to go in about three minutes, so uh, apologies if I suddenly disappear. My wife's okay. going to pull, pull with power supply, the plug. <laughs> we, would, we would finish within three minutes, don't worry. So, uh, Professor Severovich, is there a rule for uh, ablation in prevention of sudden death? Patients with uh, frequent uh, ventricular ectopy on maximum doses of beta blocker, MRA, uh, is inhibitor uh, so it is it is important to do the the proper stratification of this patient uh, ablation can be used in in those patients but not on the regular way so we need to find those who did not react on anything and then if if they have uh, the the proper way to uh, directly find out where the focus is we may use ablation however this is one of the of the method which is in the second line of the armamentorium of uh, treating those patients okay so uh, i think uh, we covered uh, uh, most of the questions that uh, we have received and uh, at the end of this uh, successful webinar, uh, I'd like uh, to thank our elegant uh, distinguished speakers today, Professor Jean McMurray, Professor Scott Solomon, Professor Peter Severovich. We are delighted uh, to have you all uh, in this wonderful webinar, uh, great lectures, uh, fruitful discussion, and we are looking to see you physically in Egypt uh, in uh, February 2021 at Cardi Egypt. Uh, you are welcome. So uh, uh, finally, thanks to Dr. Asher Badawi uh, and his team, uh, CEO of IRS and uh, Novartis for sponsoring uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much and uh, see you uh, sooner. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the invitation. Bye-bye. Thank you.